All right, well, welcome to uh, tonight's uh, book by book. We're gonna be looking at Exodus uh, 22 through 24, and it's gonna start getting into uh, specific law uh, commands. And so my goal uh, when we do this is to see if there's ways to like look at them in chunks instead of breaking down every single law because that would take forever. Um, and so tonight uh, it actually helps uh, Moses, as he was writing the, the law, he did seem to work in some kind of categories, which is nice. Um, and so we're going to look at property. We're going to look at sexual uh, laws and sexual morality and marriage. And um, then we're also going to look at the feasts as part of the commands from God. Um, <clears throat> so Sabbath year, Sabbath days, all these different kinds of great and important laws that help set the tone for the covenant community of the people of Israel. And, um, and so as we are setting the stage last week, the people heard God speak to them directly and God gave them the 10 commandments. They heard it, they freaked out and they said, Moses, you go talk to God. And that's good for us. Um, and so now Moses has climbed up the mountain a bit um, and he will, um, We'll see at the end of today's passage that he will actually go up with the elders and Joshua and Aaron and her, uh, the uh, 70 elders, they'll go up the mountain and they will dine with the Lord. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff happening in this passage, in these, this selection of verses, of chapters. So uh, let's get to it. Starting in chapter two, or 22, verse one, whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and has struck a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, the defender is guilty of bloodshed. Anyone who steals must certainly make restitution, but if they have nothing, they must be sold to pay for the theft. If the stolen animal is found alive in their possession, whether ox or donkey or sheep, they must pay back double. Um, so as we walk through, one of the things that is um, interesting as you may, as you read through the law is, you know, there are, uh, law, most laws have a, a restitution right away. Um, so like if you steal, like in these examples, you have to pay back fivefold or double, um, there was no real concept of prison uh, in the law in the Old Testament, because partly, if you think about it, the uh, people of Israel, as they were receiving the law, they didn't have a place to build prisons, so that, because they're nomadic at this point, um, but the goal, oh, sorry, the goal is not to put people into captivity in prison, the goal is to make things right. And so when we look at God's commands of justice, it really is focusing on making amends, making things right, restoring what was stolen, what was lost uh, to the people who uh, are the victims. And so the, the guilty party must make restitution. Um, and there are, one of the commentators gave us four, uh, four I think, interesting benefits uh, advantages of this mentality. It, first, it compensates victims of a crime more generously and more immediately than is the case in like our modern Western societies where you'd steal something in, from somebody. The, the per person committing the crime goes to prison, but that doesn't mean that the person who lost the thing got anything back. And so like it, it, it helps restore to that person Two, it requires the offender to deal directly with the person he has offended and to face the effects of his crime on that person. So there's a more face-to-face -face interaction. Three, it permits a repentant offender to continue a productive life immediately upon making restoration. And four, it does not require society to provide housing, food, and clothing for the duration of the offender's imprisonment. So it, it's different than our... Uh, penal system in our world like we you know we are funding people in prison through our taxes um you know that's a weird uh part of our system and 
uh, here, that goal was not to just create a prison industry in the, in the Bible. The goal was to just make things right um, and to uh, help people get out of their, um, get out of cycles of, of wrongdoing as well. So like uh, if somebody in our society goes to prison and they're a felon, that, that like sticks with them forever. Uh, it's hard to get out of that. Even trying to get jobs after prison and doing your time, like it's really hard to get back into a uh, productive member of society. And so here uh, in this system, but they are not trying to punish people forever, which is nice. So what are the <clears throat> the laws here? The first things are looking at protection of property. Um, and so if somebody steals an ox or sheep and slaughters it or sells it, then clearly this is a deliberate act. And so the law is saying like they must make amends here. Um, it is interesting that there's a difference between cattle and sheep. And so they must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. Um, to steal sheep is wrong but the sheep were not the beasts of burden to do the work of the, that the people needed to do for their fields and their crops and all that stuff. Like cattle were, cattle were like tractors. And so to steal one, uh, one ox, like to end up have to pay back five um, head of cattle, like that is a, a stiff penalty. It would be difficult to do, um, but it was, to highlight like how important these animals were to the day-to-day -day work of the people of Israel. <clears throat> and so, um, so like that, I thought that was just an interesting difference. And so the ox pun punishment is much more substantial. Then also we see burglary. There is a right for, in, in the Old Testament law, for people to defend themselves and defend their property. Um, and here, like if somebody is breaking into your house at night and in the altercation, the homeowner kills that person, they're not guilty of bloodshed, but if it's daytime, they are. And one of the reasons why is like, if somebody is breaking, like the theory is like, if somebody's breaking into your house during the day, it would be a lot harder for them to do that. But also you could see if they are armed, if they are dangerous, whereas at night you can't see as well. Um, and so you are operating in a different set of circumstances. Um, and so again, like it's not just a stand your ground and like, you know, if anybody steps on my land anytime during the day, I, I have every right to shoot them. That's not at all what the law in the Old Testament is. Like if they come in at night and try to break into your house, you have the right to defend yourself. And if they die, it is not your, uh, it is not your fault that they died. You're not guilty of it. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things here as well if, about this is from a biblical theologian named Brevard Childs, who's very interesting, a lot of really good stuff from Childs. He says this about the, of the law, to my knowledge, no other law code, speaking of the people of Israel, no other law code seems to have a similar concern for the life of the thief. In all ancient law codes, like there is no real desire to defend the life of the thief, but the value of life in the Hebrew culture and in, in God's law is so high that even people who have done wrong, like he does, there are commands to limit punishment to those people. Like you can't just wipe them out. Um, all right. And then a little bit more about property uh, in verse five. If anyone grazes their livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray and they graze in someone else's field. The offender must make restitution from the best of their field or vineyard. If a fire breaks out and spreads into the thorn bushes so that it burns shocks of grain or standing grain or the whole field, the one who started the fire must make restitution. Um, and so again, the law here is, is essentially saying like, take care of your stuff, be mindful of what you are doing and how it affects other people. And so if you are just mindlessly letting your, your flocks and oxen 
graze wherever they want and they take stuff from your neighbor's property, then that's your fault. You were being negligent. And so you, you need to make it right and not just give them something, give them the best from your crops. Um, and then the same is true with fire. Like there are one of the ways that they, people would deal with thorn bushes in particular is like to cut them up and burn them. And so like they would have these controlled fires in their, on their property, but if the fire got out of control, um, then that's due to negligence, then they must make things right in there as well. And the, um, the thorn bushes in particular, one of the things here, like you could cut things, cut up thorn bushes to like make uh, usable land. But then also you could set up a thorn bush like hedges that could be used to protect your land at like as a fence to protect your property from another person's property so that their animals don't graze into your space. And so the fire, if the fire actually like spreads through that, that could be a problem um, and could have long-term effects as well. And so and looking at how you are interacting with your neighbors, how you're taking care of your stuff, are you paying attention uh, and or are you negligent? And the negligence is um, is punishable and it's, you know, you don't go to jail, you need to make restitution. Um, and so be, don't be negligent is in the law. Um, verse seven, if anyone gives a neighbor silver or goods for safekeeping and they are stolen from their neighbor's house, the thief, if caught, must pay back double. But if the thief is not found, the owner of the house must appear before the judges, and they must be must determine whether the owner of the house has laid hands on the other person's property. In all cases of illegal possession of an ox, a donkey, a sheep, a garment, or any other lost property about which somebody says, this is mine, both parties are to bring their case before the judges. The one whom the judge declares guilty must pay back double to the other. Uh, <clears throat> so here again, if you are um, asking somebody to watch over your stuff and then it, it disappears mysteriously, it gets stolen or the neighbor who's watching your stuff uh, loses it, then there is a possibility that there is some negligence there again. And so when you talk about the how do you resolve this because then it becomes a, a question of my word against his word and in a culture that is highly honor based the idea of coming before the judges and making a vow like to say no i did not take it i did not lose it it was stolen the vow is a major um part of like if you are lying during this vow you are bearing false witness and potentially taking the names lord the name of the lord in vain you're and if you say i swear by the lord that i did not take it and you're lying then you are putting yourself in danger of incurring the wrath of god um, because you are misusing his name and so there's a high honor culture uh here where it's trying to make sure that they are respecting one another, respecting the Lord, and respecting the judges that the Lord appoints over them. Um, and so they are, yeah, so if somebody trusts you enough to loan, like to ask you to watch these things while they're out of town, you better take care of it. And if not, then you have to pay back double and or make a go to court and say, I promise, it wasn't me. Um, verse 10, if anyone gives a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any other animals to the neighbor for safekeeping and it dies or is injured or is taken away while no one is looking, the issue between them will be settled by the taking of an oath before the Lord that the neighbor did not lay hands on the other person's property. The owner is to accept this and no restitution is required. But if the animal was stolen from the neighbor, restitution must be made to the owner. If it was torn to pieces by a wild animal, the neighbor shall bring in the remains as evidence and shall not be required to pay for the torn animal. And so here again, the, the oath, if you, um, if the person is willing to swear an oath saying they did not uh, misuse or lose, or uh, they weren't negligent, or, to, or they didn't personally steal the animal, they're making this oath and you say, okay, well then the oath is now between 
you and God. And if you're willing to make that this decision, um, then you are not off the hook, but it's not a issue for the the earthly courts anymore. It's now between them and God. Um, but then it's also like, you know, wild animals are a thing. They're a real problem. And so if you are able to prove to the, the court, like, look, here are the remains of this animal that got torn apart. Like, I didn't do this. Then that also will make sure that you are not able to be uh, unjustly prosecuted for things that are outside of your control. But if you think about it, like if you're taking care of somebody else's flock, then you should be treating them as well as you would treat your own. And so if there is any way to protect against the uh, wild animals coming and destroying animals in, the, in your flock, then you're gonna do everything you can to make sure that doesn't happen in a culture, an agrarian culture like this. So um, yeah, so it's a lot of trust and honor happening in this, the, these laws here. Verse 14, if anyone borrows an animal from their neighbor and it is injured or dies while the owner is not present, they must make restitution. But if the owner is with the animal, the borrower will not have to pay. If the animal is hired, the money paid for the hire covers the loss. So this is like if you rent an ox from your neighbor, like, first of all, if you borrow the animal and it dies while you're taking care of it, that's your responsibility. Like if you rent a car and you crash it into, uh, into a building, um, then you are liable for that. And so you should have some kind of insurance to help you with that situation. If you don't have audio, auto insurance, you should have auto insurance. Um, here, if they, if the animal dies um, while the owner is away, the person taking care of the animal must pay restitution, make things right. But if you hired out an ox and the owner's there working the ox with you and the animal dies, that that is not your fault. That it, the owner was there watching it all happen. And so that is like, that's on the owner. Um, and so the if you think about like, why is this in the law? As you're reading through these things, there might be moments where like, why is this in the law and why is this here at this point in the law? And recognize that God is putting together uh, a rules for society that will help make it easier for the people to get along with one another. And the main thing that they are dealing with in their culture is as nomads, as shepherds and herders uh, is the animals. And so it's like, this is one of the top issues in the people of Israel is how do we care for these animals with all these people around? Um, and so, so that's why these are some of the first things that are given in the law. The next uh, section is about social responsibility. It's gonna talk a lot about um, sexuality and marriage here. Um, and something that is important to note is that um, children in ancient times were considered property of the parents. And in particular, women are, are virgin women were part of the property, like the, the father of the family, like took great care to protect the, the virgin women in their community and in their family, um, because it was a part of the heritage of their, their family and the family of the husband that would marry that woman as well. And so they wanted to protect the, the honor of the households, um, that there wouldn't be any question about the, um, about whose parents, like if this virgin woman got pregnant, there wouldn't be any question about who's the father of that baby. It's a huge part of this because it becomes a question of inheritance and land. It gets really, really big issue uh, as time moves forward. So verse 16, uh, if a man seduces a virgin who is not pledged to be married and sleeps with her, he must pay the bride price and she shall be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he must still pay the bride price for virgins. So an unmarried girl, um, if she uh, is seduced by a man and sleeps with that man, then that is a, the, the man will have to pay the bride price. So he can pay the bride price, which is something that would be 
established by the culture, like the region, the town leaders, all this different stuff, the families, uh, all of these bride price things were flexible, um, but they would have to, the, per, the, the man would have to pay it. Even if they didn't marry this person, he would ha have to pay uh, that bride price. And the father had the absolute right to deny the uh, a man the right to marry his daughter. Um, and so it was something that, you know, we think about as like, it's degrading to think about in our culture. Like, is it just, is our women just a piece of property? But the real issue is that they, they're trying to honor the women in, in this, in these societies. In so many other cultures, women were worthless. And here the, the people of of Israel are commanded to like esteem women and recognize that like you shouldn't just sleep with people just because you want to sleep with somebody. And so there are great costs for um, for pursuing lust in this way. And so um, so arranging these kinds of laws about bride prices and dowries and all of this stuff is to honor and protect families and women in, in particular. And so when it talks about, um, you know, here it's talking about seduction and not rape. Rape is gonna be a different thing that we will cover in the law in the future. But this is just to say like two people um, are, uh, they end up sleeping together, then that has a cost. And in, um, in the law, premarital sex is discouraged for several reasons. Um, and so this is from the uh, IVP Bible background commentary. Uh, it, the first reason it was, it's discouraged is it, it usurps the authority of the father to arrange the marriage contract. So it takes the father really out of the planning and establishing the family lines. It diminished the potential value of the bride price. Um, it prevented the husband from being assured that his first child was indeed the, his offspring. Um, and so this law regulated illicit premarital sex by imposing a forced marriage on the culprit and or fine equal to the bride price for a virgin. And so it's, um, it seems archaic. It seems strange in our culture where people talk about sex in a you know, like non-commitment kind of way. But for God's design for human sexuality, like there's a huge value placed on sexuality and, and human uh, human sexuality and, and marriage, huge value. And so it's not something that is meant to just be something that has no commitment and no consequences. And so to treat it with no commitment, like there are consequences in the Bible's law. And even now, like as we think through uh, in our culture today, like this is so different what from the rest of the world um that like the church you know we are often hung up in the church about issues of sexuality be because we're trying to like make sense of what's going on in the world but the goal should always be let's get back to god's design and god's standard let's not try to regulate people who are outside of the community of god let's not try to like solve their problems let's like Let's show an example of what human sexuality, the way God designed it, and how that can be, how that can lead to flourishing and and blessing for people. Let's put a higher value on these relationships and show that it is a good way to move forward for the people of God. And you know, people will look at the church and uh, Christian uh, Christian practice around. You know, the traditional biblical understanding of sexuality and people will say like oh, that's weird but we don't have to deal with their we, that thing and that's weird we have we are called to honor god with our lives and our our, our families and all of that and so um, when we go through these laws on sexuality there's gonna it's gonna come up a couple other times in the bible you know keep in mind that it is honoring the family it's honoring women and it's putting a high level of commitment on sexuality um, and so we should seek to honor god's design for sexuality in that way um, 
the next section of laws are kind of, uh, the, well, the first one is looking at, the, first, the next three laws look at religious practices, okay? So starting in verse 18, do not allow a sorceress to live. Anyone who has sexual relations with an animal is to be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord must be destroyed. So these are, uh, these are questions of idolatry and witchcraft, and they're all tied to the religions of the Canaanites. So the people are going to be going into the land that the Canaanites are currently occupying. And so the Lord is saying, like, all of these things, this, these are no-goes. These are non-starters for the people of Israel. So a sorceress is somebody who is trying to control the forces of creation, look into the future through divination, through spells and incantations. They're, they're messing with dark spirits. And to, to let that just be a thing that's, oh, that's totally fine. That's going to lead to greater pain for the people of Israel. And, the, you know, looking at the law against having sex with an animal is because was, it's contrary to God's design for creation. But also there, these are things that could have been tied to pagan worship practices, um, trying to like receive the power of the animal in their lives and, and, and those kinds of things. And all of that is like that God has no, no patience for that kind of behavior. Um, and then whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord must be destroyed. And this is clearly idolatry. And people, people in the ancient times believed that like, the gods could do anything except eat for themselves. Like they needed you to bring them food essentially. And so like to do that, you were bringing them the, the food that they need and they will then bless you with fertility and good crops and great families and grain and all these different things that these gods are supposed to control. Um, but they're, they're deceiving the people and they're pulling it would pull the hearts of God's people away from covenant faithfulness. And so the Lord is saying, is putting, there's going to be more laws about idolatry as we continue on through the books of the law. Uh, verse 21, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it like a business deal. Charge no interest. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, return it by sunset, because they, that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? When they cry out to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. And all of these laws are uh, caring for the vulnerable in your community. And there's a, a quartet of the vulnerable that we see mentioned often in the law and the prophets, the poor, the fatherless, the widow, and the alien among you, the, re the, the resident uh, alien, the foreigner. Um, all four are people groups that the Lord cares for greatly and he wants his people to care for them and so even the first of these commands like do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner for you were foreigners in Egypt you know the people are months out from having just been separate like liberated from slavery and the Lord in the in his law about caring for foreigners like remember how they treated you don't treat other people that way remember remember always remember the, the compassion and grace you have received pass that on you know one of the things that drives me nuts about our current culture in america is how many people are just anti-immigrant uh, immigrant of any kind and you know looking at our country and knowing where like as a white person knowing where white people come from they didn't come from north america <laughs> they came from europe and, you know, like, and thinking through, like, the, the reason the pilgrims left uh, the, the old world to come to the new world was because they were fleeing religious persecution. And, um, you know, so should we not also be compassionate to people who are fleeing persecution, fleeing 
hardship. And so like, we have to carry that tension in our world, like as, you know, as Christians, like we need to be care, care for the vulnerable as citizens of a country. We also should recognize like, yeah, there's a good way to, to handle these kinds of things. And there's a, a reckless way to handle these kinds of issues, but we can't just say like immigrants are terrible. That's part of the challenge that our country has to reckon with right now is because we're all, we're all immigrants. Our families, I, I can say with pretty good confidence that none of our families are 100% from this continent in their origin. And so we have to recognize like we, we move around and you know, we should care for the vulnerable, including the foreigners among us the resident alien, the gare is the Hebrew word gare. Um, we should care for the gare. Um, and then also like looking at widows and the fatherless. These are people who like the, the, the father was the breadwinner. They were the one who was able to do work to provide for the family. And so if the father is dead and there's a widow and children, who who's going to take care of them? There was no welfare state. There was there was no like, uh, you know, food stamps and WIC and those kinds of things. And so the people were supposed to care for them. And so there's going to be laws about how to ensure that you don't use up all of your land um, and all the crops, you don't keep them for yourselves, but you leave some for the vulnerable, the, the widow, the, the orphan, the foreigner, the poor. These are all going to be part of God's heart for the people. Um, and then even loaning money. If you like the people of Israel were not supposed to take any kind of interest on loans among their own people. Um, that's already that's that's the part of the law. But looking at a loan to the poor, like don't just treat it like a business. Don't like be compassionate with them. And so if they have nothing to put up in collateral and they're at the point where they're just saying, like, here, take my coat. My, my outer garment and I'll just work basically in my, my boxer shorts. Uh, I will, and, and then like, you're, if that's the case for this person and they're just trying to make some money, you can't as the, the landowner who's hiring these people like say, well, I'll give you their coat when the job is done. Every night you give them their coat back so that they can sleep and not be cold. And so like the idea of loaning money uh, and resources to the poor is like, we're, I'm not just trying to get something from you. I'm not trying to take advantage of the poor. I'm going to protect them as well. And so, so these kinds of, the, this is like the first time where we see the quartet of the vulnerable kind of lumped into one law play, uh, place in the law. And that's going to come up again and again. And when we look at the prophets and their words against the people of Israel, often it's because they neglected to care for the vulnerable. And um, if it wasn't caring for the vulnerable, then it was worshiping idols um, and disobeying God. So these things are all part of the high priorities for God in the covenant faithfulness is that they would trust him, that they would care for one another and that they would not turn towards idols. Uh, so let's go uh, verse 28. Do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. Uh, do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You must give me the firstborn of your sons. Do not do the same with your cattle and your sheep. Let them stay with their mothers for seven days, but give them to me on the eighth day. You are to be my holy people. So do not eat the meat of an animal torn by wild beasts. Throw it to the dogs. Um, so do not blaspheme God. Blasphemy is uh, denying the authority and the power of God to misuse the name of the Lord your God. These are all part of blasphemy. Um, so don't do that or curse the ruler of your people. And recognizing that in Israel's society, the king that would be coming later was appointed by the Lord. <coughs> and so to, to curse the king is to curse the Lord. And so that's part of what that, that law is getting at. But then also like giving offerings is one of the ways that you trust the Lord and honor God, excuse me. And so don't hold back your offerings, but to give those as the Lord commands, and there's going to be 
more explanation on offerings and, and uh, tithes and all that kind of stuff as we continue on. Here in verse 29, you must give me the firstborn of your sons. Uh, that, that is not saying like human sacrifice, your firstborns. That's never something God wants. Instead, the there are going to be laws that talk about the offerings for uh, firstborn sons as a way of buying them back from the Lord. And remember that God saved the people of Israel in the last plague was the plague on the firstborn. And so every firstborn uh, in the people of Israel is essentially like due to God. Like it's, you owe the firstborn son to God. And so how do you get, how do you walk in favor with the Lord is to purchase it back and by purchase its son back by giving an, an animal in its place. And so there's a substitute and substitutionary atonement is going to be a part of the, the law um, in the Old Testament when we talk about sacrifices. These animals take our place for our sins. And so, um, and then the, that, giving animals like in, on the eighth day, the firstborn on the eighth day is giving the, um, <clears throat> the, the animal enough time to develop to the firstborn of that animal to develop to, um, yeah, to be a healthy transition from womb to, uh, for the, the mother, uh, then also to the off, to be able to live long enough for the mother's nutrients, all these different kinds of things. There's, there's like some good health reasons here for why to wait until the eighth day. Uh, all right, chapter 23. These are laws of justice and mercy in the heading on the NIV. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd and do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. If you see the donkey or someone who hates you falling down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. Do not deny justice to the poor people in their lawsuits. Have nothing to do with false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death, for I will not acquit the guilty. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds those who see and twists the words of the innocent. Do not oppress a foreigner. You yourselves know how it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt. So these are, you know, questions uh, in law in law, law courts. Do not spread false report, reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. So don't lie and don't carry water for liars. Like if something's uh, not true, then stand up for the truth and say, that is wrong. And I can tell you why. Um, and don't just go along with everybody saying like, oh yeah, no, I think it is. And then you get lumped up into the, the, the group of wrongness, the, the crowds and the mobs. Um, and so we have to uh, do everything we can to side with truth, even if, even if a poor person would benefit from bending the truth a little bit. Do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. Don't take advantage of the poor, but also if the poor person did something wrong, then they did something wrong. The law of the Lord is to be just. And so if they did the wrong thing, then they recognize that was a, the wrong thing and they need to pay restitution for that. Um, but then also do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. In verse six, you know, like you could say, well, you're poor, so you, maybe you're just a bad person. No. Seek out the truth. Don't just assume that somebody is a, a bad person because they are poor. Um, and then uh, verses four and five, I love four and five here. If you are, uh, see like your enemy's animal wandering off, don't just be like, well, that sucks for them. No, go get it. You're supposed to love your enemies too and care for your enemy's possessions. And this is part of the way that we, help our society to stay just, to recognize like, you know, I, I don't, it doesn't matter what they do. I can control what I do. I can be responsible for me and my attitude, my, my actions, 
uh, even if I know that person is my enemy and I don't want to help them. And so, um, and so having all of these kinds of laws in the midst of laws that concentrate on honest, godly behavior in case of lawsuit, God is in effect saying to his people in the midst of giving you laws about loss of behavior, I want to insert a reminder that I expect you to truly love your neighbor in every situation, no matter how your selfish inclinations might cause you to feel. Love your neighbor. So when Jesus says, like the greatest laws are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Like these are what they look like. Loving your enemy, loving your neighbor, like this is all part of it. And sometimes it's hard to do that because there are real jerks in the world and like we love them anyway because we do not want to be jerks um <clears throat> all right verse 10 this is laws about the sabbath for six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused then the poor among your people may get food from it and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the name of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. Um, and so the law of the Sabbath, the first part of this that he, the Lord gives us is about letting the land lie fallow, uh, letting it rest. Um, and as we look at like what that means, it's probably not that there were absolutely no crops happening for a whole year. What was probably happening was farmers would section off parts of their land and they would always have a part of the land that was like, that part is not being worked this year. And then they would rotate through. And this is something that uh, good agricultural practices are still doing. Uh, crop rotation, it helps get the nutrients back into the land uh, as the, um, the, the plants decompose and the nitrogen and all the, the things that are necessary for healthy crops, they all get worked back into the land because it, nobody is pulling the fruit and the, the crops off. Um, but also during that time, the poor can take food from that part of the land. So even in the, by rotating crops every year, there's a different section of their, their farm that is resting. Um, that gives the poor food every year, not just on the seventh year. And so, um, so that's part of how they probably actually carry that out. But then there will be the 50th year where everybody is supposed to take the year off. Everybody is supposed to not do any work during that year. Um, and so that's a different thing, the year of Jubilee. Uh, but then even the weekly Sabbath is still intended to be a time to rest and refresh. So there's an annual Sabbath for land. So the land can rest and refresh. And then there is a weekly Sabbath for people and animals to, to rest and refresh. And this is part of the way that the Lord calls us to worship him and honor him. Um, and I do find it interesting that verse 13 says, uh, do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. The other gods were not giving days, people days off. They were not giving people a Sabbath rest. And so the Lord is trying to help set up a contrast between him and the false gods. Uh, and on Sunday, I talked about celebration and how the Lord gives us a, the laws to throw parties. So here are some of those parties uh, in verse 14. <clears throat> Three times a year, you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. Do not offer the blood of sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must not be kept until morning. Bring the best of the first fruits and of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. 
do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. And that's the last one there is kind of weird. But um, here we see these festivals are supposed to be um, corporate. Biblical worship is over and over again, a corporate experience. And one of the things that this last year has really put a strain on uh, on churches and Christians is we we had to go without the corporate experience for a while. Like being together is a big deal. And um, trying to keep a community uh, in alignment while we're not together is really hard. Um, and so for the church, like having the weekly gathering is a, is a major part of how we move forward uh, and, and trust the Lord and, and are encouraged together and stuff. And so here, the people, they don't have like, they, they're all throughout the land and they have one temple that they're going to build in Jerusalem or one tabernacle that they're all going to rally to for hundreds of years. And the goal with these festivals was to bring them all together and to celebrate God's goodness. And so the first one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is before the harvest is really happening. Um, and, and so there's no real work challenge there for the people. It, it is a lull in the, in the calendar. They could have come. Um, and this is a, the Passover, and the Passover is a, uh, is a feast meal, um, and households will come together and uh, observe the Passover. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a part of that. It's a seven-day observance of God's faithfulness, um, and, and so they were supposed to do that. The festival of the harvest is about, uh, or the, so the feast of first fruits is about um, 50 days after Passover, so that's verse 16, um, and so yeah, this is the first fruits, and they are bringing the early wheat crop as a way to, as an offering to the Lord, a tithe off that to to offer to God, not because God needs wheat, but as a way of celebrating his faithfulness. And so they would uh, use that wheat to provide for the, the priests who did not have land of their own, as well as the poor among them. And part of that would then be create this big party when they came together uh, for the festival of, uh, of first fruits or Pentecost, as we call it. So it was supposed to be a celebration. And then the festival, then gathering is the, the festival of tabernacles. And again, it was another week long celebration. It was essentially camping uh, in tents as a way of remembering God's faithfulness to the people of Israel while they were in the wilderness. Um, and again, this is supposed to be a party. It's supposed to be a celebration. Um, and so there's supposed to be great joy in these, these times of the, as the people come together and remember God's faithfulness and trust the Lord for his continued faithfulness. And so while they're doing this, while they're worshiping, how are they supposed to carry on their worship? Um, and so, you know, no one is supposed to come before the Lord empty handed. Everybody, when they come, should bring something. And the law specifically is saying all, all the men of Israel should come, but the truth is they probably all came um, to these festivals. It wasn't just men coming, but the whole families would come. And uh, so don't, do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast because yeast in the Bible has an idea of contamination and sin. And so the Lord is saying, I don't want anything with yeast in these sacrifices to me. Don't bring uh, bread with blood in it as part of what is going on. And, because that's one of the ways that people in the ancient world would consume blood as a way of worshiping false gods. And so they would break, bake it into their bread to make it more palatable. Um, then like the fat of the festival offering must not be kept till morning. Like as soon as you are making the offering, burn all of the fatty portions that are supposed to be designated to the Lord. Don't, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it right now. Don't wait. Um, and bring the best of the first fruits of your soil. So don't just give like some of the things or the ugly apples or whatever. Bring them all. Bring the best, give them to the Lord. And then do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Um, now, this law is strange, but it is about mercy and compassion for life, for, for, for animals. So if you think about it, like the goat, uh, a pregnant goat gives it as a baby and the firstborn 
is supposed to be offered to the Lord, right? And so how are you going to offer that to the Lord? Well, you're supposed to burn it, but what as an as an altar on the altar. But what the other cultures would do is they would boil these animals in their offerings. And sometimes they would boil them in the, in the milk of the mother. Um, and the priest would then eat that animal. Um, but that mother's milk was also in that goat, the baby goat. Like that's how that goat was surviving. And so this is a, uh, a, a reminder to be humane to the animals, even the animals that you're gonna sacrifice, treat them humanely. And one of the implications of this law is like, it, it is not kosher to have meat and dairy. And so like the, you're not supposed to have pepperoni pizza. And I did not know that. <laughs> and have been, we used to rent our uh, school building in Northgate to a Jewish community of their school and they were very kosher. And I had a whole bunch of pizza parties with the youth group. And they came in one day very mad and said, you were having unkosher food in our kitchen. And now we have to go through a whole process to bring it back to kosher. And I did not know that you were not supposed to do that. So we, uh, yeah. So when you think about those kinds of laws, there are real world implications for today. Um, all right. Verse 20. <clears throat> This is a break from the law now that we're going to get into. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and you do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on you, on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you and drive the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites out of your way, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give into your hands the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them in, live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. All right, so this is... The law, the Lord is setting up a, a covenant with the people. A part of the covenant is remembering what God has done. I have brought you out of the land of slavery. And then it's like stipulations, like follow these commands as a way to honor the Lord. And then there are blessings that come along with following God. And so here we have the blessings that the God, that the Lord will drive out the enemy nations, that he will go before them, that his angel will do this work. He will he will be a terror for these other nations. All of these things are reminders to the people that God will fight for them and he won't abandon them as they honor him. But there are these commands that say, don't follow other gods, destroy every indication of idolatry in the land, do all these things as a way to keep the Lord God, Yahweh, focal point of your religious life in the land. Um, and so as we are looking to what God is calling the people to do, he's asking them to trust him, to receive his blessings, and to see him fight on their behalf. And so this is all part of the covenant command that the Lord is putting together. Um, and so let's look at verse 24. I'm going to read all of 24 and then talk a little bit about what is happening here because it's a pretty cool scene. 
Um, then the Lord said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, those are Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he set, sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in the bowls and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. The book of the covenant is most likely a scroll, not an actual book like we have. Uh, they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Moses then took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Does that sound familiar? This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Um, Jesus is calling back to these moments here in, the, uh, in Exodus saying there's a new thing happening here. Um, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses sent, set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain. The cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai for six days. The cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So the Lord has given the first understanding of the covenant to the people. And so now Moses is going down and saying, look, this is what this looks like. The Lord, you've, I've, he has told me this. And this is what he's calling us to do. And they say, yes, we are for it. We trust you. We're going to do these things. And then God says, all right, bring up some of the elders and they will be with me. And they actually see the, the glory of God, but like just under his feet, not the whole, not all of God. They see under his feet and the, his, where is under his feet becomes like a, a blue pavement. Now, one of the things that's interesting is what lightning does to sand. It creates glass. And uh, when we think about like God's presence there, the power, the majesty, and like on the mountain, he could have transformed the desert sand that's on the mountain into a glassy surface as he's dwelling there with them, which is amazing. And even more amazing is they see all of this and it says that they didn't die because they saw God. They lived. God didn't strike them down. Instead, they have a meal with the Lord. And God is inviting them into a relationship, into communion with him. And so they eat with the Lord. And that's when Moses then leaves the, the elders, Aaron and, um, and her, are basically the going to lead the people. While well, Moses goes up to the presence of God for six days, um, and then he goes up and he even further up the mountain, where the glory of the Lord is dwelling in even greater intensity, and he's there for forty days. So forty-six days, Moses essentially is away from the people, and he's up on the mountain. And while he's gone. Not great things are going to happen. <laughs> it's going to go bad. Um, so that's where we'll leave here um, because we'll see God with the people or with Moses in the next section. We'll see how the people respond to 
Moses's absence. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. So any questions, any thoughts? There's a lot that we went over in these three chapters. Um, but yeah, I'd love to bring clarity where I can bring clarity. Is there questions? Okay. I think I've always thought of the um, the law about not uh, not boiling a young goat in its mother's milk as the beginning of the kosher laws as another way um, for God to set apart his people because um, they were living in a time without refrigerator refrigeration. Mm -hmm. And um, so the kosher laws are kind of a way to keep people from getting food poisoning um, and keeping them healthy. Yeah, that's a, that is a major part of the kosher laws. That is like a, a benefit that like we can see, right. but they might not have like seen. So even like the animals that they're not allowed to eat, those animals are gross. Right. <laughs> Don't eat scavengers. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so there's, those are the kosher laws are actually really good. And if we were to truly try to follow the kosher laws, our, our diets would be better just right. in general. Um, we'd be sadder because we can't eat bacon, but that's why I love Acts so much. Peter saw the animals lowered down on the sheet and the voice of the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, such great stuff. <laughs> so, this big God was like, you know what? I've kept bacon to myself for so long. It's time for you all to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Yes. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. I had a thought, um, kind of a question too, mm -hmm. but, um, I was curious about, so, um, with like the different festivals, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering your thoughts on like, should we as Christians today have some form of like structure similar to those festivals with the sole purpose of like, like, like what you said, like the goal was of like, people gathering together and remembering the Lord in that way. Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it feels as though in like modern Christianity, like those kinds of things have kind of trickled out and there isn't that sort of same kind of structure. So I don't know. I just was wondering your thoughts on that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a really, that's a, I think it is important for us as Christians to remember that our faith is meant to be lived in community. Uh, that is one of the key things that is uh, a struggle for modern Christianity because we have made our faith an individual decision and relationship with Jesus. And so one of the challenges for the church in the 21st century is to find ways to reincorporate the corporateness of our church and our church community. Like, we are in this together. And so um, I'm actually going to talk about this a little bit on next Sunday in the message. Um, I was looking at uh, Ephesians um, and talking about the us-ness of the book of Ephesians. Like when we read the Bible and we see you, sometimes we think me, but a lot, most of the time in the New Testament, you is you all. And so instead of thinking me, we need to think we and, um, and so that's a huge part of the challenge for the church in our day. You're right, Sydney. Should we do these festivals? It wouldn't hurt to do these festivals. But there are traditions in the church of, uh, of festivals that would be greatly beneficial for churches to re-engage with. Um, we have two every year that are pretty common, uh, Christmas and Easter. But Christmas, like the Advent season, is much bigger than just uh, celebrating the birth of Jesus on December 25th, because Advent has a season of preparation up to Christmas, but then it also goes beyond Christmas into the um, Annunciation, the dedication of Jesus. It goes, not Annunciation, dedication of Jesus, um, 
Uh, and then also after the dedication of Jesus, there is the Feast of Fools, which is a celebration of God's um, divine humor in uh, how he uh, upsets the, the way of the world. And instead of sending a conquering king, Jesus, Jesus comes as a baby, right? And then after the Feast of Fools, we have what uh, we would call Festival and Mardi Gras, which were church festivals that then got co-opted by the world. Um, and so we like to reincorporate those kinds of things into our into our churches and to recognize the seasons and the festivals of the church calendar that could be really helpful um, for us. Part of the challenge is you start bringing those things into like modern Protestant churches and people are like, what are you Catholic? We're not Catholic. What are you doing? Um, and so you have to like kind of be delicate in how you bring those things back into your, into the culture. So even like Lent, which is the season we're in right now, like there's people who I've talked to say like, I'm observing Lent and like, no, that's a Catholic thing. It's like, no, it's a Christian thing. Like just preparing for the resurrection of Jesus is, is not a bad thing to do. Um, and so seasons of, of lament like Lent, and then also seasons of celebration like Easter. And Easter is not just one Sunday, it's Easter tide, which is weeks between Easter and Pentecost, like are supposed to be celebration weeks, you know? So yeah, Sydney, to answer your question, we should do stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, how we do it is, um, how we do it is a um, bigger question. So Jay, you have a question here. What is the festival of fools asking for a friend um it's awesome it was awesome and i it got really uh co-opted by people but it, it was like a roast in church basically so like if you know like the comedy central roast like you would make mm -hmm. fun of somebody um in the festival of fools part of the tradition was that the under priests would make fun of the bishops uh, and like they would make fun of the power players in the community. And, um, and it, it was intended to be a celebration of joy and looking at, um, at God's just divine humor. And it is, uh, I wrote about it a little bit in my dissertation because um, that's part of what I was looking at was comedy and community building. And so finding these festivals and these rhythms, like recognizing that comedy is not just about telling jokes, it's about bringing joy and the root of comedy is comida, which is also Latin for food and meals and all this stuff. Like this is all part of bringing people together. And so, but the challenge is, you know, bishops had a thin skin. And so then like, we shouldn't allow these people to do this anymore. And so the power people said, no. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it but, sounds like it was something that was also meant to try to create humility you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're making fun of them and then it's a way to be like, okay, you know, I get it, funny, whatever. But you said you were talking about Christmas and Easter and, you know, his, historically these have been put on these specific areas in order to, um, as you said, co-opt specific areas. Like Christmas was put in place where Yule was, which was a Nordic holiday. And then Easter was put on another um, holiday, which was for Ostara, um, which was also a goddess that was from a pagan deity. My question is, is there anything that can show when the birth of Christ or, or around the time birth of Christ actually was and around the time that, that Jesus's death was that way we could truly um, celebrate them when they actually are? Does that, am I making yeah. sense? Uh, yeah, the the cr the crucifixion was with tied to Passover, mm -hmm. so that's always in the spring. So like, a stara, however you pronounce that, like that also is a springtime pagan festival. But mm -hmm. the church jumped in on celebrating resurrection close to Passover, and so the Passover is the Jewish celebration, and it always is the first full moon after the first. Uh, first day of spring. Okay. When Passover is supposed to happen. So that's why, like, Passover, Chrissy, you celebrated Passover this last week with Dove's family. Yes. 
Yeah. And so, because Passover was actually technically last week. Right. But, um, but I don't know why. Happens on uh, like the eighth day, I believe, um, or on the day of the full moon. So that's why we did it um, Saturday evening. Yeah. yeah. So Passover moves around. Yeah. So, okay. like for the, it's not always on a Saturday, right? Or a Friday. No, Whereas, it follows the lunar cycle. Yeah. Like the rest of the uh, Hebrew calendar. Right. And so, Easter, we celebrate Easter on Sunday because we know that it was the first day of the week that the Lord was raised from the dead. So, mm -hmm. the, the, I don't know why we didn't have, like, I don't know who decided, like, Passover was on Saturday last week. I don't know why the next day for us wasn't Easter. I don't know, <laughs> but like, I don't, I, I'm not a part of big calendar, so I don't have that kind of power. Um, and so <laughs> like, so we are like tied to Passover in that regard. We're, we're always gonna be close to Passover. As far as Christmas, you're right. I have no idea when Jesus was actually born. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to actually tie that down to December 25th. And mm -hmm. so the, the goal of like celebrating the birth of Jesus, like we, we could do it in September. Like yeah. we could do it anytime. Um, and there are ancient church calendars that like tried to work their way back to like figuring out when this could have been. Um, and so I'm trusting tradition to say like, they, they worked pretty hard to find a time, not just to say like, we're gonna take over the pagan holiday, which, you know, even if they did say like, look, there's also a pagan holiday here, but you know, this is close enough to when Jesus could have been born. Like, I'm okay with that. Cause the goal is not the, the specificity of the day as mm -hmm. much as to remember the purpose for what we're doing. Got it. So. Yeah. But if you don't want to celebrate Christmas, that's fine. Christmas is my favorite. I celebrate it year round. <laughs> well, good. Good for you, man. <laughs> Every day, you should be at the day that Jesus is born in your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Uh, Tony asks a question. Could the phrases do not allow to live, put to death, and must be destroyed mean different ways of dying? Wow, Tony, that is, uh, you're, you're talking about like different methods of execution yeah um, that's what I, that's what i'm thinking could it be in different ways of you know executing a person um maybe but would, the the purpose is still they're gonna die they're still, they're gonna, i know i just i'm just i'm just curious i was imagining like this to destroy me they probably burn you to, um, to, yeah. to, to refuse, to allow you to live, they probably starve you to death or something, lock you in a chamber and you stay there till you die. Or um, could put to the, death mean physically, like go out and hang this person right now. I uh, think it is more like a, eliminate them as soon as you can. <laughs> like looking at the way that the law talks about uh, punishment for idolatry, like as soon as possible, remove the idolater from your community. Remove the the influence of evil from your culture. Um, and so, like the I don't I wouldn't necessarily say it's different ways of execution as much as like the finality of their life and and the urgency. Yeah, there's urgency there that um, is very important for God to say like. Don't say like, well, this per yeah, this person is sacrificing their children, but we're going to give them a second chance. God's like, that's not a second chance option. Like, no, <laughs> right away, they have to stop. So yeah, I was just curious why they just didn't use the same phrase through all three. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe right. they he was were just going right. Through. Yeah, <laughs> he's like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm saying the same thing a lot. I'll mix it up. <laughs> so i don't know um but it's most likely just to focus it's, on especially like, the fact that it's supposed to be especially if it's supposed to be a law mm -hmm. 
if it's supposed to do the same, it should just be read the same way and left up to be the to no interpretation. So that's just curious. Yeah. yeah, I I didn't see anybody saying like to be not allowed to live is this or they must be destroyed is this. Like I didn't see any delineation of what those different things could have meant. Could have meant so. Yeah, but good question. Now that right? APA style. What's that? You know? What's that, Jay? Or he's just trying to nail the APA format, you know, for the for the paper, <laughs> making sure. Yeah, it's like I'm gonna get, I'm gonna hit this word count one way or another. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, oh I don't miss those days. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? No. All right. Well then, I. Uh, I appreciate you guys and your willingness to stick through. I mean, we're getting in, gonna get into some, um, in, like the books of the law, I love them. They have some great stories and some great events that happen. And then they also have lists of ways to kill people. Um, so, or reasons to execute people. Like it's like not super fun um, at reading, but then there's also really good reading. And so thank you for sticking with us over the coming weeks. It's gonna be, uh it'll be interesting for sure so i have so many questions about that oh bring them like write them down i love i love this stuff so uh it'll be fun times so all right well you guys take it easy and i will see you next week